Continue to breathe. If that's not a mantra for these times, I don't know what is. So at this time, I am thrilled to welcome our guest speaker, the brilliant Janata Petrus. Janata is a creative activist, writer, playwright, poet, and multidimensional performance artist. Her work centers Black wildness, futurism, ancestral healing, sweetness, spectacle, and shiver. Her recent young adult novel, The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, received the 2020 Coretta Scott King Honor Book Award. Please pick this book up and read it if you haven't already. Um, Sasha and I read it. It is gorgeous, uplifting, magical, and profound. Janata, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Are you? Yeah, so yeah good hey, I know. Y'all. Thank y'all for inviting me. We're so glad you're here. Um, so our youth group has been studying liberation and anti-racism through the lens of imagination. So we thought it would be fun to structure our time with you by giving two of our youth, Sasha and Anna, the, the chance to talk with you directly. So, I love that, by the way. I love that. Because sometimes you're like, okay, I'm talking, I'm talking, but is this what people want to hear? But to have young people ask questions, especially, you know, as a writer. So thank y'all for doing that. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, we thought this would be a really fun format and a, just a really great way to get to know you. So um, mm -hmm. I will get out of the way and turn things over to the three of you. Well, welcome to Janata. I'm Anna. Uh, we're really thrilled and honored to, that you could be in this community with us this morning. Could you maybe start off by sharing a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, I mean, as of recently, maybe I'll speak backwards from what I've been doing, what's the newest things I've been doing. So the newest thing that I've done is being a young adult author. So that's kind of like, what I'm doing now. Um, but I've also have a background in um, performance art, you know, so like creating sort of experimental installation art um, that often would deal with some of the topics that I address in my writing. Um, I also am a poet. Um, and I also, you know, I have done a lot of um, circus art um, in my past, like, um, yeah. So I feel like um, all of that, though, sort of blossomed out of me being a youth worker and working with young people and also working um, as a, you know, urban farmer and I'm um, working on um, farms and things like that um, when I was out of college. So yeah, like, I think like it's interesting now because um, especially, you know, just being an artist and realizing so much of my artistry was accumulating itself when I was, you know, studying abroad in Brazil or, you know, teaching urban farming to kids in Minneapolis. And um, when I lived in Harlem, you know, like I was just like in the dirt, I was just like in these experiences. Um, but so much of it feeds the kind of art I make and the art I make is very much interested in including experiences of Black folks that's multi-dimensional and layered and complicated and joyful and romantic and sweet um, and sensuous. Um, and also like includes the ways that our ancestors and the experience of our ancestors inform how we get to live in this world. So um, yeah, I feel like, you know, and I also, you know, I also have done a lot of cooking. My mom's a, a cook and my family's from the Caribbean. Um, so I always help my mom. She's done a, um, a lot of catering, um, Caribbean catering. And I did that. I, you know, worked at vegetarian restaurants here in New York City. So I kind of a person that likes to do a lot of stuff. Even now, like I just always need to be doing a lot. So, yeah. When I should be writing my, I shouldn't say I should, I shouldn't shit on myself, but yeah, I am writing a new book too, so. <laughs> that is so cool. Thank you for sharing that. I'm Sasha. I'm also in the youth group with Anna here at UUCD. Mm -hmm. So first off, thank you so much for the gift of your writings and your art. Your work has brought me both joy and a lot of healing. So your poem, can we please give the police department to the to the grandmothers, 
was written in response to the police killing of Michael Brown in 2014. Mm -hmm. As a person of color, I've struggled with fears and nightmares around police brutality, and this poem really helped me to get through some of those times. Can you share a little bit about your inspiration for it and then read it for us? Oh, shoot. Okay, dang. I will be ready to read it. Yes, I will. Um, what was I going to say? Well, it was sort of this thing in which um, I think like so much of my experience as a, as an activist has been like, oh, like we have to sort of get rid of what is scary and what's bad. And I think that's the way that a lot of society treats things that are perceivedly negative or what have you. It's like, let's get rid of it. Let's you know, like we're so focused on the destruction of it that we don't get to think about this dreaming and this imagining. Um, and I also um, was, you know, like I've, I've been an activist since I've been y'all's age, really, like since I've been very young. Um, and I mean, and specifically around police um, violence and brutality and murder um, due to people I know being murdered by police. Um, and I really, um, yeah, I wanted to think of like, well, what is the next reality? Like, what is the next experience? If this is a thing I don't want, if I, you know, and 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 also with, you know, Michael Brown in particular, um, I remember it was like this thing where it, there was such a clarity that like, what did this kid do? Like, okay, maybe he took some blunts out of a corner store. Like that may be the worst thing this kid did. And just like the ways that his death was justified because this police officer was afraid of him, you know, I was like, oh, I was afraid. And he was so strong and violent that I just started shooting him. You know, that was like the, the defense. And a lot of people have accepted this idea of like kind of this Uber kind of like um, power of the black body to create pain and fear or what have you um, that like, they didn't like look and be like, that's just a kid. He was just 18, you know, like, and I've done, like I said, youth work. So like, I mean, I'll see kids that I work with. I'll be like, you know, like I'll go up to them and just be like, you know, like these cops like come and they come with, you know, guns and they come to like regulate. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it, you know, like I, I've grown up in the hood. I've grown up in hoods all over, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, I'm like, you know, what would fill that space? You know, like, yes, you know, people are like, well, if the police weren't there, you know, well, it's like, well, the police are here and they don't do nothing. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say they don't do anything. I do think there's people, that's a lie. Actually, I was thinking about this other day. I was like, I remember one time I was riding my bike and I will read the poem. I know it seems like a long one to answer, but I will get to the poem. <laughs> um, I was riding my bike. I was like maybe 19 and I was riding my bike and I totally like, you know, because I'm such a like dreamy person. Like I like looked off somewhere and I totally bit it. You know what I mean? Like just zoop, like was just like split, like just my yeah. bike. And I remember like this police car, like coming out of nowhere, coming and like this cop assisting me. And I, I, I have had so much negative experiences with cops that like, I was like, <gasps> you know, but he was very kind and very warm and really helped me make sure my bike was cool. And that was that, you know? And I was like, he didn't need a gun for that though. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I was like, that's the thing. It's like, you know, the, the, the militarization of police, it's not, you know, it's, it's a certain mentality. It's a certain way that like, you know, this has a legacy of violence. Anyways, I was just thinking like, you know, anyway, so I feel like a lot of the um, poem itself talks to like, you know, how I feel, you know, what is the sort of attention and support people actually need? And not this way that like has been, you know, indoctrinated in me and all of us since, um, you know, we were, young people that like, hey, you know, the, you need the police or there'll be chaos, you know. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, you know, during the drug, you know, the war on drugs. And mm -hmm. so many people in my family have been incarcerated. So many kids I knew had gotten incarcerated or just policed, yeah. you know, like you're living in your community. Here, I'm pulling up the poem now. You're living in your community and you're just like, okay, the cops just are like, okay, you're a black kid. You seem like you might be up to something. Like that's what was the nineties, you know? Mm -hmm. And just the amount of anxiety, you know, that a lot of people still feel, you know, around the cops. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. 
Um, okay, dokey. Okay, y'all. Are you ready for the poem, everybody? Yes, we're ready. <laughs> All right. Could we please give the police departments to the grandmothers? Give them the salaries and the pensions and the city vehicles, but make them a fleet of vintage Corvettes, Jaguars and Cadillacs with white leather interior, diamond in the back, sunroof top, dig in the scene with the gangsta lean. Let the cars be badass. You would hear the old school jams like Patti LaBelle, Anita Baker, and Al Green. You would hear Sweet Honey and The Rock harmonizing on We Who Believe in Freedom Will Not Rest bumping out the speakers, and they got the booming system. If you up to mischief, they will pick you up swiftly in their sweet ride and look at you until you catch shame and look down at your lap. She asks you if you're hungry and you say yes, and of course you are. She's got a crown of dreadlocks and on the dashboard you see brown faces like yours, shea buttered and loved up. And there are no precincts. Just love temples that got spaces to meditate and eat delicious food, mangoes, blueberries, nectarines, cornbread, peas and rice, fried plantain, fufu, yams, greens, okra, pecan pie, salad, and lemonade. Things that make your mouth water and soul arrive. All the hungry bellies know warmth. All the children expect love. The grandmas help you with homework, practice yoga with you, and teach you how to make jambalaya and coconut cake from scratch. When you're sleepy, she will start humming and rub your back while you drift off. A song that she used to have the record of when she was your age. She remembers how it felt like to be you and be young and not know the world that good. Grandma is a sacred child herself who just circled the sun enough times into the ripeness of her cronehood. She wants your life to be sweeter. When you wildin' out cause your heart is broke or you don't have what you need, the grandmas take your hand and lead you to their gardens. You can lay down amongst the flowers, her grasses, roses, dahlias, irises, lilies, collards, kale, eggplants, blueberries, she wants you to know that you are safe and protected, universal, limitless, sacred, sensual, divine, and free. Grandma is the original warrior, wild since birth, comfortable and loving fiercely. She has fought so that you don't have to, not in the same ways at least. So give the police departments to the grandmas. They're fearless, classy, and actualized blossomed from love. They say what they want and they wear what they please. Believe that. There wouldn't be noise citations when the grandmas ride through our streets, blasting Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, Marvin Gaye, Alice Coltrane, Jimi Hendrix, Harris One, all that good music. The kids get a hula hoop to it and sell her lemonade made from heirloom pink lemons and maple syrup. The car is solar powered and carbon footprintless. The grandmas designed the technology themselves. At night, they park the cars in a circle so all can sit in them with the sunroofs down and look at the stars. Talk about astrological signs, what to plant tomorrow based on the moon's mood and help you memorize Audre Lorde and James Baldwin quotes. She always looks you in the eye and acknowledges the light in you with no hesitation or fear. And grandma loves you fiercely forever. She sees the pain in our bravado, the confusion in our anger, the depth behind our coldness. Grandma knows what oppression has done to our souls and is gonna change it one love temple at a time. She has no fear. That is. That poem is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that poem. I think the, I think the comparison to how we would change the police department with our grandmothers, I think that's very sweet and very powerful. So do mm -hmm. you, as an activist, have any ideas about how we as a society can pivot, it, can pivot our world to a community where care, kinship, and tenderness are prioritized? Hmm. I think we need to reckon with our past, you know? Like I think a lot of 
why, and I think this is like with any time in life, you know, even on your own personal journey, I think like you get into a way of being, you know, and every once in a while you're like, you know what, is this working for me? You know, where did I get this way of being, you know? Um, and I think that's what's kind of, I think an opportunity of this moment now, you know, is that we get to be like, you know, America was built off of, you know, stealing land and very, you know, terrifying and still existing ways like the land um, and the peoples of the land are still here. And there's a way we don't acknowledge that, you know, like just now, like in the last couple of years, we're just acknowledging like, hey, we are on Anishinaabe land, we're uh, uh, on Dakota territory or what have you. But um, even going deeper than that, well, what is our, what is our accountability to that? What is our relationship to healing that? You know, not just naming it, but like being like, let's go into these spaces that might feel scary. You know, like I think, you know, even if, you know, you have a conflict with the homie, you know, you're going to be like, oh, gosh, man, I miss my friend. Or I feel like I really did something terrible. And I just, oh, but, you know, like to kind of, you know, cleanse your spirit, you know, to like get your spirit good, you got to go to that space. And I think that's a very like, you know, sort of, you know, uh, microcosm of what I think needs to happen in the United States. It's like, yeah, like, there's a reason why what happened at the Capitol, you know, I guess a week and a half ago now happened. It wasn't, you know, like these people are doing exactly what we were all taught to understand America to be, you know, like I grew up, you know, um, like uh, I, I pledging allegiance to the flag, you know, and as a black kid um, in a country that still, you know, hasn't acknowledged the wound of, Black enslavement and how that built the very capital, the very capital those people stormed were built by Black people who were enslaved. You know, like that to me is like, these things will always happen. Like a person who's a doctor will tell you or a healer or of any kind, if you don't address things, like it'll come back up, you know, it'll just come back up. And I think um, for me, it's like, what does it look like instead of putting so much money into military, to like deal with some extreme mental and spiritual health services, not just for folks of color, but specifically for white people who are who think like that. Be like, yeah, baby, sorry, baby, y'all ain't better. I know y'all was taught y'all was better. I know y'all was taught the four founders was the best and that they was, yeah, they, they were like really negative white men who took their trauma from Europe to the United States to perpetuate trauma, you know? And I think there's so many great thinkers, you know, both BIPOC and white allies who are like, let's do this work instead of denying it. And I think that's kind of the like, sort of, you know, uh, bittersweet beauty of this moment is that like, no one can deny what's happening anymore. That this doesn't have to come from some sort of like long rooted disease of white supremacy, you know? I mean, anybody who denies it is willfully in denial, like willfully, <laughs> you know? It's like, so now I think like, I was actually talking to um, a friend about it last night. I remember when I was young, the idea was always like, we need to fix people of color. People of color, like, oh, they have so many issues. They just got these issues. And it's like, we just need to figure out people of color, you know, black folks and their problems and why can't they succeed? And native people, why do they struggle? And now we're like, oh, white people, y'all are the work, y'all need to do this work. Y'all, you know what I mean? I feel like now white folks are being like, you know what, we need to do the work. We need to kind of like, you know, look at our resources and wealth. What, you know, ancestor, where did that come from? What healing do you need to do with your ancestors around the ways that they came to this world? And to, I mean, to this, um, to this hemisphere, you know, like, so for me, like, I think there's a, uh, yeah, I, I feel like it's just do some deep healing and, and fearless ways and, and, and also um, pay folks of color and indigenous folks and black folks to heal. Like, instead of being like, let's get good jobs for people be like, no, let the trauma, <laughs> that everybody's experienced, like pay them to, to deal with the trauma and the long standing trauma. I know these ideas might seem outlandish, but trust me, if people were to listen to me and Adrian, Adrian's a friend of mine. Like, I think like there's thinkers like Adrian, there's Resmaa Menakam, there's countless people who are like, 
let's let's come up with blueprints and let's implement it rather than resourcing war, rather than resourcing the police, you know, who are basically, you know, these are infrastructures that were created to support this way of being, of white supremacy, of white power, of white safety, like the fact that people could even run up on the Capitol like that. You know what I mean? It's like they were literally being assisted. And I think all of that stuff is plain as day. I'm seeing there's stuff that people are saying on CNN that I never thought they would say. Like even saying the word white supremacy without like, mm, is this scary to say? It's like, let's call it what it is so we could actually deal with the problem. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> but I wonder what y'all think too. Like, what do y'all think? Y'all are the kids. Like I'm doing my best to make this world a doper place for y'all, but y'all give me some instructions. Like what could I be putting into action now by the time y'all grown, y'all could, you know, then <laughs> have it be ready. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I, I love your approach to using joy and sweetness in your work. And that kind of leads us into our next question. So you, your work, just like the grandmother's poem, is full of joy and sweetness. So what's the role of joy in social justice activism? And how do we hold on to hope when it, it really feels like the world around us is just is falling apart, kind of? Mm. Well, I think art, nature, and spirituality, and drinking water and eating home cooked foods and being with people you love, I think is, I mean, and I'm not trying to sound cute or trite. Like, I really think that, you know, part of what I wish is that our society would get more, I mean, I feel like industrialization and capitalism was made possible through racism and all these other, a lot of these other, you know, systems, sadly, capitalism, you know, um, has like decentralized who we are from our lives and decentralized our family from our days. Mm -hmm. And I think like, you know, my wife and I both have been working from home. Our daughter has been schooling from home. And um, I've really been just appreciative to even winter. Like I was like, I love winter right now because it's not like I have to like, oh, let me get outside. Let me yeah. take this, take this off the car. Ah, let me, you know, it's just like winter just gets to be like, let me go for a walk and experience the snow. And so for me, I feel like, you know, how do we just like center healing and being well and being good as a part of our existence rather than I think this idea of, you gotta work 40 hours a week, that's eight hours a day. And then the weekends are so tired and often, you know, we're on our phones and we're connected to our jobs and we're feeling anxious. Like I remember, and I still feel anxious, you know what I mean? Where I'm like, oh, like I'm not doing enough. and. I remember feeling that way beginning being a kid in school, you know, and I feel like what's the way that we get to reimagine our society and, and really, okay, so I know I said that question, it may have sounded rhetorical, but I really do want to know what young people think. And y'all could wait till the end of our conversation to be like, hmm, because I don't want to put y'all on the spot because I know that's kind of hard. But like, I really would love and I'm sure the congregation would love to hear, like, you know, what are the ways, you know, that because young people, like, I remember when I was young, I was like, I got these ideas, son, man, y'all need to hit me up for these ideas for the future. Yeah. But adults were like, you're a child, mm -hmm. you silly being, you're so confused, you know, like, and I remember being like, when I'm an adult, I'm not going to be that an adult. I, I really want to, like, include, you know, like, intergenerational movements. Like, it's, we need to talk to our elders, we need to talk to young people. So mm -hmm. anyways, and all of us in between. That's all I'm going to say. But I, now I forget the question. Remind me the question. <laughs> the question is, what's the role in social justice activism? And how do we hold on to the joy when it feels like the world is falling apart? But I, I love what you said about that. And I'm a, I'm a sophomore in, in high school. And so my teachers are starting to talk to us about college and what do you want to do? What do you want to major in? What do you want to... You, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, our society says so much about like, you grow up, you get a nine to five, you make enough money to retire, and then, you know, take care of, of your kids when you grow up. And I've just been thinking like, that doesn't, that doesn't like resonate with me. See, That's see, not... see this mold, see this mold? 
Mm-hmm. Take that mold and go, crack. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. Like mold is so moldy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that A, nobody really gets to even do that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I really feel like you're forced to follow your bliss at this point. You yeah. know, that's yeah. it's like, because even these jobs, you know, like nobody could have told me I mean, I was y'all age. I wanted to be an English teacher because I was like, well, I like books. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't think I could be a famous writer or, or a, a, a one that paid. Yeah. Like it was so much like, how can I fit into a mold? And the only mold I thought I could fit into is being an English teacher. Mm-hmm. So I think like it's good that already your spidey sense is like, hmm. Nah, like I don't even know. You know, Mm -hmm. I think the the pandemic also has kind of highlighted that since like I'm in online school, so it's kind of more just like what's gonna work for me at this point instead of like let's get the A, let's do all the honors classes and stuff like that. Yeah, take care of your spirit. Like you are a whole being, not just. Because in high school, I wasn't the best student because I also, I think I had undiagnosed ADHD. Mm -hmm. Like my parents weren't really like, you know, yeah, they, 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 you know, never had the experience of finishing high school, neither of my parents, you know, so I really had to kind of figure stuff out by college, you know, like I started to get in my flow, but I certainly feel like as a young person, you know, you're still has so many questions about who you are, especially in this moment. Like I really have so much compassion for young people who don't get to like, you know, cause school is all about who you get to kiki with in the hallway, what's for lunch that day, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of that was taken from this moment, you know, and it's isolating. Well, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. I personally feel like I could just sit here and um, listen to you all the whole day. Um, but anyway, yes, thank you to all three of you for bringing your, your beautiful spirits to this uh, service and to this conversation. We are so blessed to be able to learn with and from you this morning.